start. Yeah. Keep the time. <clears throat> Testing. Okay. So thank you very much for coming to our CS uh, School of East Asian Studies seminar series. And today we are very happy to have Professor Paul Bauman uh, here with us to talk about from the sublime to the marvelous. Uh, cultural translation from the Grandmaster to Shanti. So I, I'm not sure if you've watched the film, but you will see the clips, and I'm sure you will like it. So these are two uh, very important uh, transnational martial art action films, and and um, Professor Paul Marman will talk about the aesthetics um, and manifestations and how they connect to the idea of the sublime. So I can't wait <laughs> for this talk. So let's briefly um, introduce uh, Professor Paul Marman. So he is Professor of Cultural Study and W Head for the School of Journalism, uh, Media and Culture at Cardiff University. He is author of a dozen books on subjects ranging from cultural theory, uh, popular culture and cultural politics to diverse aspects of martial art in film, media and physical cultures. His most recent book is called The Invention of Martial Arts, uh, popular Culture Between Asia and America, published by uh, Oxford University Press uh, in 2021. So, no more further ado, let's uh, welcome Professor Bob Allen. Thank you, Wayne. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time on a Friday afternoon to, to come and listen to this. Um, so, the title is From the Sublime to the Marvellous. Um, the subtitle is Cultural Translation from the Grandmaster to Shang-Chi. So we've got some undergraduates in. As, do we have postgraduate students? Or are you all undergraduates? Some PhD students or master's students? Okay, so we've got all the way from undergraduates to uh, PhDs and postdoctoral researchers. Okay, so easy, easy to find my right level to pitch this at. Essentially, um, I am interested in... Uh, cultural translation, the changing status and meanings of, of, of things from one iteration to another iteration, one context to another context. I am um, increasingly interested in the concept of the sublime, which took me by surprise to, to, to find after all these years that, that I find that an interesting concept. Um, but hopefully it will become clear why I think it's an interesting con uh, concept. Um, I want to begin by showing you two clips in case you haven't seen the film. So the, this is a, a clip from relatively early on in the Marvel film. Uh, I'll turn this projection low. Um, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. So this is um, 2021. This film came out. It's quite recent. You, most of you probably, I'm assuming, have seen it. But it doesn't matter if you haven't. Um, so let's watch this. Okay, so, so that is from the 2021 20, film um, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. And I chose to show you these things in the wrong order um, for a reason. So this is now from uh, quite early on seen in The Grandmaster, which is a Wong Kar Wai film from uh, 2013, I think. Um, Tony Leung is the male character and male lead in both films. Um, so let's watch this one now. So the deal was in that in that duo. Um, if uh, if anyone broke anything, oh God. if anyone um, broke anything, then he'd lost. Projection low, that's too dark. Projection normal, that's too bright. Okay. Um, so those two those two scenes. No, I want you to be. Yeah. Um, if I'd shown you the, I think I think if I'd shown you the Grandmaster scene first, and then. The Shang-Chi scene, and I have done this with uh, my own students in Cardiff, everyone laughs at the Shang-Chi scene because by comparison, it's like, like a sketch drawing of a, of, a, of a Mona Lisa or something incredibly ornate and complex. Um, but what's interesting is that um, these are two... Um, so this is, the, call this the original and this is the translation. Um, and there's different, they're clearly connected. There's clearly a kind of, it's a, it's a duel, but there's a conversation going on between the protagonists, which is almost like it's a dance. 
it's almost balletic, and it, then it becomes kind of like the start of a love story, right? There's that kind of connection between the two. Um, this one is infinitely more subtle and complex than this one. I think this is more kind of cartoonish. But what interests me is, and this is where I, I think I got my title from, is that something about this scene, if I, I'll run these um, silently in the, in the background, if I can turn the sound off. Um, although it works quite nicely with the sound. So can I put that about halfway through and go back to the same sort of the fight begins, the fight begins. So um, I'll talk about them as, as they play. Um, this is where I got my title from. I thought the first time I experienced the Grandmaster, I found it to be one of the most profoundly beautiful films that I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I watched this this fight scene and the fight scene with Gonger and um, uh, Wen Ma over and over again, and I was completely transfixed. I would look at the screen and I would just marvel at how could you even conceive of a scene like this? Like, how could you make something so completely staggeringly, awe-inspiringly beautiful? Um, so I, I hadn't really thought of it consciously as sublime. Right? I'll get to the sublime in a minute. But it was when I saw this, and I realised that this was a replay. They've, ta they've actually taken Tony Lung. They've gone, we like that fight scene, so let's do it again. But in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And we like Tony Lung, we'll have him, because he's really cool. And this is like a kind of like a, a baby, childish version of the same. It's a cartoon, um, comic strip version of the same. So I wanted to analyse these and just think about what is going on and think of this as cultural translation. So what I would do, and so undergraduates among you, postgraduates, anyone, what I do when I want to analyse something and do a kind of cultural analysis of something is I do a basic semiotic analysis. That is, I look at the literal denotation what actually am I looking at? What's in the scene? What does it sound like? What happens, right? And then I think about the connotations. This is semiotics 101. Denotation, stuff that is actually there. Connotation, what does it conjure up? What's the overall effect of it? And also listen to the sound. What's the soundscape like? What are the aesthetic codes and techniques? What is being translated, right? So this is, this is what I've spent some time doing. This is what I would, I mean, we can talk about what we actually see here um, in a little while. But, um, like, what I want to um, argue for is an understanding of translation not as, uh, not as a, a, a literal translation, but more as a style of, of cultural analysis or ideology analysis. So, what binds these texts would be called intertextuality. The second one borrows textual elements from the first one. That's intertextuality. This is a conversation between these two texts. One is a, is a, um, is a remake. Um, so the, so the Shang-Chi is a reiteration of the Grandmaster. But I don't want to think about it in terms of theft. I don't want to think of it in terms of appropriation. It's not appropriation. It's a reuse, it's a repetition of reiteration. That's how culture works. I don't like the cultural appropriation arguments because they imply that a culture is a possession of one group of people, normally one ethnic group of people, and other people can't have that. And that's apartheid, and that doesn't work like that. Culture works intertextually, and that's one way of talking about how culture works. But any reiteration is an alteration. It's never a straightforward repetition, okay? And my proposition is that the alteration that we see between these two films, it's not really random. It's not just chance, the differences are chance. And if you look at the differences and think about them, then you can learn something about ideology. Um, so that I'm going to argue that something ideological happens here. On the one hand, the people who made this wanted to translate something that they picked up in the first film. But they translated it in such a way that it reflects an ideology, a very different ideology to the one that was involved in the making and circulation 
of the Grand Master. Um, so the question is, what is it that's being translated? Um, the, like the literal translation is, is the action. There's certain set pieces, the circularity, the glances, which kind of, kind of go, oh, they like each other. Like, you know, in both films, you have this, these, these equivalences, these similarities. And my sense is that what they're after translating in the second film and having and capturing again and replaying is some kind of affect or experience, some kind of emotional structure of feeling. Um, and I think that the name for this affect or the name for this structure of feeling is the sublime. So obviously my title is From the Sublime to the Marvelous and the real expression is From the Sublime to the Ridiculous. So yes, we can look at um, at, look at Shang-Chi and go, by comparison with the Grandmaster, it is ridiculous. But I think that's a different discussion, right? Because what I'm interested in is this, this use and this transformation of the sublime, if it is the sublime that we're talking about, which it might be. So, um, we might not know what the sublime is. Um, there's a, there are several different, can you, is that too bright now? Okay, so is that, that's better, right? So, okay, we'll just stick with this now, okay. Different, the notion of the sublime is kind of first really theorized in a text in the Western tradition by Longinus in, just after AD, 2 AD. Arguably, Chinese philosophers like uh, Zhuang Tzu uh, were already writing about something like this. In the European context, it really kicks off in the 18th century. Edmund Burke writes about the sublime, and contrasts it with the beautiful. He says, you're not, the sublime is different to the beautiful. Beautiful is a garden. Sublime is a terrifying mountain, right? Something that's so magnificent. Um, beautiful is like in a frame. Beautiful is a picture. Sublime is the landscape, is the, the weather, is the storm. This was picked up by Immanuel Kant, um, and also philosophers like Hegel, there's lots of other philosophers, especially in, in German, um, who really, really went for this concept in a big way. The sublime can be theorised endlessly, and I want to spend some time running through some different statements about the sublime in order to make my case that we're dealing with the sublime in the Grand Master, and also, ultimately, my larger interest is in arguing for the place of the sublime in martial arts, generally. Um, and there's another tendency that I want to talk about, which is that in the European tradition, things that are sublime very often become orientalized. So we've heard of Orientalism a little bit. Orientalism is kind of fetishistic romanticization of Oriental things. Um, and we can argue that quite easily and quite convincingly argue that that scene in Shang-Chi is Orientalist through and through. The music is plinky clonky, it's bamboo, there's cherry blossom, all these, let's throw some more Oriental stuff in there, right? We need some more silk. We need, we need some more circles, right? <laughs> Make it more oriental, god damn it. Whereas the, 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 Shang, the, the Grandmaster scene is very, it's got contemporary European Italian opera soundtrack. The film itself has this complicated relationship between the kind of interest in the, the Chinese aesthetic and there's European aesthetics run through this as well. Much more complex text. Um, so I want to talk about the sublime for a little while. So. Um, the main enduring theory of the sublime is Edmund Burke, so writing in the, in, in the 18th century. And uh, his theory of the sublime is that there's something terrifying about the sublime. So an enormous mountain or a landscape, a mountainous landscape or a valley or a cliff, it's beautiful, it's, it's kind of beautiful, but it's scary. Immanuel Kant argued that the sublime is, is almost always huge. It's so magnificent and enormous you can't take it in. And Hegel um, has a more complicated argument, certainly in the way that it's interpreted, interpreted these days, which is that it's, it's, the sublime is something that cannot fully be signified. 
You can't put it into signification. It's ineffable. It's too huge. It's the void. It's, there's any number of words we can slot in there. A theorist like Slavoj Žižek, who some of you might have heard about, is a Lacanian kind of theorist. He always talks about like the traumatic real, the void, this, this kind of impossible excess of signification. So these are some of the, the, the main theories. Edmund, Edmund Burks is the most accessible, I think. Things that... Are, yeah, this is... Sorry, this is death by PowerPoint, right? Don't worry about the words... The big, the one important ones I've highlighted in blue. I'm at the stage now, which is the literature review stage, where you read everything that you can read on a concept or a, or a theme, right? So I'm just like, I, as yet, I can't filter properly the stuff on the sublime because all of it quite excites me. So the sublime fills you with a delightful horror. These are quotes from Burke. It's tranquility tinged with terror, such as this is a, a, a bit from a, um, a Turner. Uh, poster, a painting um, about storm, and, and these these artworks in the in the nineteenth century were, were like terrifying people. They were like, people were fainting in front of paintings by Turner because the sublime was too overwhelming for them. So the sublime is often brought about by encounters with nature. Burke thought that things that produce sublime sentiments in us include the obscure, the dark, the hidden, the vast, the deep. The ancient, the great, the tragic, the silent, the exalted, the infinite, and the eternal. Now, jumping ahead slightly, just so you know where we're going with this, if you read Edward Said on Orientalism, these are the words that are used to describe the East. In Said, it's the Middle East and North Africa for everyone. Since Said, it's been East Asia. Is the, as the pinnacle. Throughout history, this has changed a bit. The European Oriental, it's changed. It's been India, it's been the Middle East, it's been the Far East, it's been East Asia. Um, the sublime also causes astonishment, says Burke. Um, and it disables our rational faculties. And I think that my experience of watching the Grand Master adequately speak to that, I could not stop watching it. I was watching it on a... On a um, on a MacBook Pro with a really high resolution screen and headphones on, and I watched it over. I think if I'd seen it in an IMAX, I think I would have like exploded. Like my head would have exploded like in Mars Attacks, you know, I just would have been like, I can't cope with this. It's, too, it's like a sensory overload. So the sublime floods our senses, short circuits our cognitive processes and leaves us speechless and bedazzled. We're enthralled and it connects us with the idea of extra human powers. That's the sublime. This is this this yeah. This one is the scene, which I, I won't. I mean, I could just literally watch this um, over 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 again. It's proper like you know when you get like goosebumps and hairs and, and it tingles down your spine. Like when I watch Bruce Lee, still right. I'm look, looking at Wayne here because he's not in yet. Bruce Lee films. It's like still like well Bruce Lee's gonna fight. He's gonna fight. Go on Bruce. Go on. Anyway, the Kantian sublime. Uh, is about bigness, hugeness, vastness. Um, and this, this guy called um, Lak Chuan Chang wrote a book um, trying to theorise it more precisely and he kind of connects the philosophical notion of the sublime with psychological experiences. So um, Chang argues that an experience of the sublime involves a sense of realising oneself and the boundary between the possible and the impossible. So on the summit of Mount Everest or wherever, the mountaineer is undergoing a peak experience, possibly experiencing transcendent ecstasy or being supraliminally aware of the limit of their ontological status, perhaps even feeling a sense of glory. So Chang argues that Mount Everest is a great example of the sublime because you don't even have to go there. You can just see pictures of it, see representations of it, watch documentaries like Sherpa, and, and you just go like, oh my God. And it evokes our awareness of our being on the threshold from the human to that which transcends the human. It borders the impossible and the impossible, the knowable and the unknowable, and so on. So it's all about liminal, limit, absolute limit experiences. This is our sense of, of the sublime that, that Chang offers. So, 
My question is then, can violence be sublime? Because I like martial arts, right? And I like full spectrum martial arts, like from Tai Chi through to MMA, right? This, whatever, just bring it, I'm interested, right? I'll have a go. Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, meditation, breathing exercises, MMA, Eskrima, anything. I'm, I'm happy, I, all of it. Can that be sublime? My hypothesis is yes, right? Is there a cinematic sublime? Um, my hypothesis, not my own hypothesis, but yeah, people in film studies, yeah. Philosophers go, no. Philosophers say, no, 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 film can't be sublime. Film is just cheap thrills. You have to go to Everest for the sublime, right? Film studies people go, no, you don't. You just go to IMAX or get a Power Mac or, you know, get something really... <laughs> a MacBook Pro. So, um, I found an article by a guy called Harvey Ferguson who argues that the battlefield, the military battlefield, is actually a scene of the sublime in so many different ways. You can't, comp you can't take it in. The battlefield, think any battlefield, think First World War, Second World War, think a riot, think a, a, a fight that you've been in or that you've witnessed. It's, you, it's, 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 it's chaos, it, it's, it's an excess. So he argues that it's, it's a negative kind of sublime because we lose ourselves, it's chaotic, it's terrifying, it's, it defies our ability to represent and comprehend what goes on. So sublime violence, um, Ferguson argues, is connected to this ungraspable of otherness. Combat is ungraspable otherness. It is as if all reality being concentrated in the body, the world ceases to exist, or at least becomes strangely dematerialized. This, it seems, is the specific character of the sublime in combat and the source of its peculiar ecstasy. This transition from sensory bombardment to the derealization of the world. Um, an absolutely fascinating article in which Harvey argues that the problem of the sublime as the this excess that you're immersed in on a battlefield is why they do military training they train you so you don't notice this so you can function automatically in a battlefield situation without going oh my god I'm completely overwhelmed and paralysed and incapacitated by this so he connects the, the idea of violence to the sublime because it's aesthetically overwhelming. It, we have no coordinates. We lose our ability to formulate memories. It's, tr it's like the psychoanalytic definition of trauma. Um, I can, if anyone wants this, these notes, just uh, I give them to Wayne and Wayne, or I, to you, whoever. My email is all over the internet, so that's fine. Um, so people have also argued that in, even in the sporting world, in the context of sport, you can have sublime violence, even when watching the UFC, watching an MMA fight. People have studied um, the audience responses to different situations in a, in a cage fight. And um, audiences don't like excessive violence, which is repulsive. They don't like boring, insufficient action, you know, and people are just in a clinch, not moving enough. Boring, right? And they don't like soft, palatable, clean, practices. They want sublime aesthetic violence. What is that? Perfect techniques, perfect jumping spinning kicks, perfect spinning elbows, that this kind of, this hideous brutality, like destroying someone else's ability to be conscious. That's sublime, is so the argument goes. In the context of film, arguably, Fight Club is all about such experiences. So, what is so? Who's have you seen Fight Club? It should be compulsory view, I think, right? Fight Club is such an interesting film about masculinity, experience, affect, you know, gender. It's about so much stuff. And this article is more about the novel um, Fight Club than the film, but it translates into the into the film fine. The argument is that the sense that Fight Club kind of conveys is that there's something momentary and inexpressible in a fight. It's beyond the symbolic. It's in, in psychoanalytic terms, it's the real. When we fight, 
when we have these physical encounters that are terrifying and painful, that's you connecting with the real, beyond the symbolic order. Um, it becomes so, but it, in that moment, at the start of Fight Club, and it, it, the argument is um, in the novel Fight Club is that it's kind of Nietzschean. These, this new connection with your brute physicality and the pain and roughness of life causes a revaluation of all values. That sounds like Nietzsche. Anyone who's read any, any Nietzsche, that's, that's very Nietzschean. Um, and there's a connection with the void, which, that which, which is that which um, exceeds signification. So, is there a cinematic sublime? Yes. I think probably more than one. Loads of different ways of, just as there can be so many different experiences of the sublime. There's loads of different um, possible cinematic sublimes. So this, these are all, all points from an essay by uh, Cynthia Freeland called The Sublime in Cinema, which is kind of still a very well-respected um, statement of the situation. So uh, Freeland's argument, she follows the big philosophers and she modifies them a bit. She says there's, there's four factors to make something sublime for a film or a cinematic object to be sublime. First, and most centrally, that it calls forth a characteristic conflict between certain feelings of pain and pleasure. It evokes what Burke labelled rapturous terror. Um, second, the sublime, something about it is great and astonishing and awesome. Third, is that it evokes ineffable and painful feelings through which a transformation occurs into pleasure and cognition. The ineffable feelings are related to the second feature, greatness. Something about the sublime object is so powerful or vast that it is hard to grasp or take in and painful. Um, but it says that the sublime involves an experience of something almost too great to be presented or represented. And fourth, hello, and the final feature of the sublime is that it prompts moral reflection. Um, so um, Freeland's argument is actually that there's a certain point in a film where you notice it's a film. The film can only be sublime if you notice that it's a film and you go, wow, how the hell? Like my experience of this scene in The Grandmaster fits all of, uh, all of Cynthia Freeland's categories of what the sublime experience is, where you go, Jesus, this film, this is the most amazing construct. How did it happen? Okay. So which theory of the sublime seems relevant? There's, we've got loads of choice. We've got loads of different philosophers, loads of different theories, loads of different arguments about the sublime. And we've got two films. We've got the Grandmaster, Hong Kong film, 2013, Shang-Chi, Hollywood film, fully intended to be transnational, fully intended to be a global product, right? Which theory of the sublime? Um, so, Longinus is the, is the oldest European theorist of the sublime, well, probably the oldest. And Longinus has a sense, has a sense of a cosmic sublime, which is a kind of intimate connection with what is called primal oneness, this idea of a cosmic sub sublime and undifferentiated oneness. And this was picked up by later European thinkers like Nietzsche and Hölderlin. And um, it's, a, it's a tradition of that connects the sublime to nature and to everything being kind of harmonious in a way that might already start to resound for you. Because the person, the scholar, um, Ming Jun Lu, that I got this argument from, connects Longinus' argument about the cosmic sublime with uh, Zhuangzi's cosmic with Zhuangzi's work as well, and argues that these people are arguing the same thing, that there's a certain theorizer. So I don't know, I don't know if you have a term that is directly translatable in Chinese to sublime. Because sublime is a Europe, concept of European aesthetics. So to argue that Zhuangzi is talking about the sublime, or Lao Tzu is, is talking about the, the sublime, is a claim to make, an argument to make. But nonetheless, um, Liu makes that claim. And 
argues that the sublime can be experienced in things like silence, intense and silent motions, just a, a scene that, of, of, of perfection, of everything being in its place, of everything being um, in order. And I think that we, this is a kind of a trope and a regular theme that we see throughout, for instance, um, not just this It Man film, not just the Grandmaster, but it's, a, it's something that's attributed to characters, to kind of these kind of Confucian characters like It Man um, in all of the relatively recent It, it Man films. So even this scene, this moment at the start, this is the, this, a moment just before the start of the fight scene in, uh, in the Grandmaster, There's, and it's surrounded by the, the Italian operatic soundscape, and it's signifying tranquility, and it's signifying contemplation, and it's signifying something. That, I mean, this is not just, I mean, this is not a guy, like, you know, get warming up for a fight. He's just standing there, leaning. And then also that, you see this in more than one It Man film, don't you? He's just leaning against the wooden dummy like that. Because it's, it is him. It's like, it's next. And you see this a little bit, I think, in some Jackie Chan films. This is a massive digression now. <laughs> where where it's, your relationship with that is that is harmonious perfection. Like, that's him. He's, he's eroded that. All of the, anyway, we could do a real reading of that. And think about that in lots of different cross films. And, and I'd be happy to. But not now, because of time. Um... So, uh, there's this other joker, some guy called Wayne Wong. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Wayne Wong argues that um, these Chinese philosophical concepts like Wu Wei and, and ideas from Taoism um, are um, instantiated and materialized and performed cinematically uh, in lots of different ways in Chinese and Chinese informed films. And this essay that I'm quoting at length from here is um, it's called Nothingness in Motion, Theorising Bruce Lee's Action Aesthetics. And, um, and Wong um, identifies certain cinematic devices, certain performative devices, reversal and return, and circularity of course, signifying tranquility, among other things. Um, <laughs> So he argues for there's lots of scenes uh, in Bruce in Bruce Lee films where this kind of situation, Bruce Lee doing this in uh, in in Jingle Men in um, in Fist of Fury, this is not just to psych out his opponent. This is actually a performance of his tranquility, um, and it's a kind of sublime moment. It's a kind of expression of that sublime being at one. With the forces in play here, it's, not, it's more than a man facing another man. This is Bruce Lee in the zone, peak flow, peak experience, at one with the Tao, all of sort of thing, and being tranquil in that. So this takes us back to, I guess, the idea of circularity. Now, in the Grandmaster, right? Um, Gong Er is essentially a practitioner of uh, like Bagua Zhang, right? Would we say is that correct way? And it's like it's circles. It's all circles. It's round. It's backwards. It's returned. So this is just some guy that I found. This is a, a gif I found online. Someone essentially doing uh, walking the circle the way they do in Bagua. This is what Gong Er does. But we see this massively expanded and much more directly emphasized. In Shang Chi, I mean, we keep seeing the the constant thing. So she's doing this thing, and then she's moving in circles, and the whole fight goes round and round and round, and it spins and they spin into each other, and they spin past each other, and and as go, as going in circles. So arguably, we could say, and we, I mean, if only the author were here, if only Wayne Wong were here, we could ask him if perhaps. This cinematic iteration, this Hollywood iteration of circularity, exemplifies you know, this kind of Taoist sublime aesthetic. Or if there's something, that it, or if it doesn't, right? I'll defend Wayne Wong, by the way. 
But I wanted to have two closing questions. Um, and these are questions that, that come, from, come from elsewhere as well as in connection with these films. Why is the aestheticization of violence so often the orientalization of violence? Right? Wushu, Kung Fu, Karate. Why are these forms of, of choreographies of violence so popular? Um, and why is orientalized violence so often depicted as the most sublime? You don't very often, I mean, maybe you do, see uh, cinematic representations of boxers, like European ones. <laughs> Like, like that guy in the Man film, what's it called? Twister. All right, I'm English. I hate you Chinese. Come on, please be rules. <laughs> the, like the English in Hong Kong films. They're always shouting! <laughs> you goddamn Chinese! And they're normally played by Australians or South Africans, right? Good I sport, I'm English. <laughs> I'm the governor of Hong Kong. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> that is a digression. But it's a very interesting, think about that, the voice, right? How, how, do, how do Hong Kong filmmakers think of the British or, or until the 90s? Really shouting. Right? Lotus, count on it. Um, anyway, sorry, this is like, so that's not sublime, right? Queen should be wrong. But this stuff is. Um, even though you get this stuff in European uh, martial arts too. Um, so these are my closing questions here, and my, my sort of answer is because in the European tradition, European includes North America, of course, because North America is so white and European, that from the, so it's not the sublime to the ridiculous, that's only one step, but in, in, in the Western tradition, from the sublime to Orientalism is only a small step. There are, in kind of the psychoanalytic terms of cultural theory, it's almost overdetermined that a sublime experience, especially with nature or with your one's own body, like if you're doing some pranayama breathing and you start to have an out-of-body trippy experience, that's because you're now, what, the kundalini dragon is rising or something, right? It's always orientalized. And Edward Said's take on this is that we live in this era that's still infected and saturated in the Orientalist imagination. So this is a quote from Said. The problem every writer on the Orient has faced, how to get hold of it, how to approach it, how not to be defeated or overwhelmed by its sublimity, its scope, its awful dimensions. Uh, and actually, I was, it, one thing I, I noticed recently, I, don't, I can't remember why, I don't know why I noticed it, is that there's a poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge called Kubla Khan. It's one of the most famous, most anthologized English language poems, like British English poems in the world. It's 54 lines long. Begins, in Xanadu did Kubla Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree. Xanadu, Shangdu, right? Kubla Khan, I mean, come on. And this is the pinnacle of the definitive poem of European Romanticism. It's also a high point of Orientalism. And it's all about nature and magical powers and the sublime. The poem finishes them with, uh, with Coleridge going, if I could revive within me her symphony and song with such deep delight could win me, win me that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in there, that sunny dome, those caves of ice. And all who heard should see them there. And all would cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. Weave a circle round him thrice and close your eyes in holy dread. For he on honey do you have fed and drunk the milk of paradise. Right? This is all Orientalism. The reason I know it's because I did it for my A-levels. <laughs> and I learned it. I learned most of the stuff. I can, tell, I can quote Macbeth as well. Um, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so... 1797 that was written, definitive poem of Orientalism, definitive statement of the, of the uh, a definitive statement of Romanticism, definitive statement of Orientalism, is fantasization, fantasy about the East. 
So this is a quote from uh, Ivan Kalmar. Uh, no greater tragedy could possibly have befallen the Orient than to have become, rather than an ordinary region like all others, a location of metaphysical fantasy mistaken for reality. In the paradigm of Orientalism, once you, start, once you put on your Orientalism glasses or you put the world under the Orientalism microscope, the whole Orient, the, Orient, the East Asia, India, everything over in the East, becomes a fantasy, which has, it exists on two levels at the same time. There's the actual existing thing and the fantasy about it, right? Whether that's a tragedy or not is something that's up for debate because is Orientalism a bad thing? Always for Saeed. For Saeed, it's a bad thing. And Saeed's more interested in, for instance, like representations of Muslims, representation of Palestinians on the news. Yeah, all right. That's a bad thing. But this other poetic Orientalism, this, the, the, the Orientalism of the Romantic folks, is that a bad thing? We can debate that if you want. Um, so some conclusions. How long have I talked? A little bit longer than I wanted. I'm sorry. This is, let's conclude here then. So, just, some, just to tie some of this back together, because I know I've been all over the place. When I approach cultural texts like these, don't think in terms of ownership. Neither film is monocultural. Uh, the, film, the films are so complex already. There's no appropriation. Don't, I don't approach culture that way at all. The reiterated set-piece fight is actually better to be approached as a kind of translation. Like, and we can look at both of them and go, well, what's the first one? Because we can speak both languages, right? Languages, and we, we can watch the Grand Master and go, okay, I get it. We can watch Shang-Chi and go, okay. And we can go, well, what's the difference? And why? what's the nature of that difference? And why? And what effect does it have? So my sense, and I think that, I'll stick with this, even if you really disagree with me. I think that I am fairly committed to this, that whatever affect the Grand Master seeks, which I think is sublimity, Shang-Chi translates all of this into Orientalism. Think of all the music, da 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 ding da 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 ding right? And it's just like, it has to be a hyper-Orientalist. So translating the Oriental into the marvellous is entirely in keeping with the Western traditions of Orientalism. So from the sublime to the marvellous is but a small step. On the philosophical side of it, I think that the Longinus joint uh, cosmic sublime idea fits the martial arts orientalist sublime better than the Burke Kant terra sublime book. That's just what it feels like at the moment. Um, and I also think that it fits better than the Hegelian sublime, but we can talk about that if anyone cares. But the cosmic sublime is, I think, what we're seeing in terms of the cosmic sublime, these powers of nature and the earth and the natural, it's having an interesting resurgence today. Um, the idea, they talk now about conspirituality and the cosmic right, um, and the cosmic sublime is not a purely like innocent thing, it's an ideological thing. So if you look, for instance, at a lot of like anti-vaccine discourse, you know, anti-vax stuff that came up in 2020, a lot of that was committed to a sense of we shouldn't need these West, this Western medicine, man. This Western medicine's bad for us. We just need to, like, you know, eat clean, eat some sushi, do some qigong, and we'll be okay, right? Strengthen my own immune system. And that kind of, that legacy is not, not a particularly brilliant one, but I think that we're still living through that. So I'm sorry I went on for a bit longer. Um, thank you for your indulgence. I'll take questions if you if you have any. All over the place, I know, but hey. <laughs> so I I should have like plans like this. <laughs> okay, so thank thanks, Professor Bauman, uh, for the wonderful, like informative and theoretical uh, understanding of the idea of the sublime and it's fascinating, right? So um, I invite any questions from the audience that you would like to, um, yeah, to know more about. Uh, Jane. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I, I really like the model of the sublime and I totally agree that it, um, it can definitely be found in martial arts um, in a variety of ways, particularly MMA. 
Um, but uh, one of the things I was wondering about is what happens if we step away from the text and try and theorize this with audiences and, and practitioners in mind? Like, what is the role of habitus or, or like habituation yeah. in making things legible as sublime? So, for um, example, yeah. um, the, uh, the Grand Master, like, it's a beautiful scene, but it actually uh, didn't do as well within Chinese box offices or Hong Kong as it did in other parts of the world. Um, whereas Shang-Chi was actually quite popular, even though it's a bit schlocky in a way. So you've got that kind of ethnic aspect, but then also you've got the aspect of how, when you like your example from MMA, you know, for a, uh, like a Brazilian jiu-jitsu or judo, like a grappling practitioner, watching somebody like slowly play that little chess game and get that wonderful, whatever, rear naked choke or something, is the sublime for some watchers, mm. whereas for a general audience, yeah, it's, it's the really spectacular big kick that um, manages to catch somebody just at that moment. So, yeah. Yeah, what, what is the role of the audience and their, their perception of habit? Yeah, I think that the, the word... It's, you know, you don't have to describe it. This is the sublime, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it doesn't have to be called that. But in the European tradition, it is. I think that, like, nowadays, you know, affect theory is the, is the like, what is the transformative effect of this experience or this, this, this film or this, this situation? And, and it's often translated into emotional terms, and it's like awe. Like, tr traditionally, the sublime is anything that you go, oh, like, it's just awe-inspiring. Um, and also, a lot of the stuff, it's still, still stuff being written now in, in traditional disciplinary philosophy. They argue things like, it's actually probably the... So that in that piece about the, the battlefield sublime, the guy actually says something like, probably the... Um, oh, no, it's not, it wasn't that piece. It was the piece about the destruction of the, of the, of the palace, um, the, one of the first texts I quote from. Probably the officers experienced the sublimity of the emperor's palace. Whereas the soldiers probably didn't. They're like, that's just the most elitist, uh, class-based nonsense. So like, if you've gone through school and someone's told you that, look at the ornate architecture, it's sublime. And you go, that's sublime. But a soldier wouldn't, because they, they're just working class oiks. I think that the notion of the sublime is not kind of sacred or sacrosanct here. It's just that I think it names a word in the European tradition of, of experience. Experience is very probably universal, right? Um, or more or less universal, but I'm inter and I think that within the context of certain forms of practice or experience, a lot of what draws you back to something is the sublimity of it. That's a word for it. That intense affect. So I'm guessing you're interested too. But I am drawn back into violent martial arts because the power of the experiences I can have there is quite transformative. So. You know, when you feel, and you're like, oh, man, no, I'm definitely going to, I'm done. You, you're, you're fighting for your life. Your body knows it. You're being choked, right? That experience can be described in psychological terms. And, you know, psychology is replete with, with vocabulary for that. But I also think that it does match onto the notion of the sublime. Or if you, you a knockout punch, head kick, sublime. Beautiful, bam, spinny kick, like taekwondo kick to the face. Sublime. Um... So, and as for Shang-Chi versus the Grand Marshal in terms of box office popularity, I think that, uh, I mean, that's just, that's, that's to do with film genres and distribution networks. And, and I mean, Wong Kar Wai is not, he, like, he's a highbrow direct, aesthetic director, right? I ask that in terms of thinking about what's translating into what, basically, in terms of this theory of translation, because Wong Kar Wai, even though, like, I mean, I absolutely love the Grand Master, and I think it does reflect a lot. Um, of things, particularly as somebody who actually does Bhagavad Gita. But um, uh, I don't see it as a particularly Chinese film, to be honest. Okay. Um, because, in fact, the choreography in Shang-Chi has a lot more fidelity to older 90s style um, like Chinese action choreography, which is quite showy um, and you know, has the kind of slightly cheesy element sometimes. Um, but uh, but whereas Wong Kar Wai's film, I think, actually is set apart from a lot of other martial arts genre films, and that is what makes it sublime. But yeah. Um, but so in terms of what's translating into what, I, I was kind of wondering if that's a kind of interesting question. Yeah. 
I'm not starting from monocultural Chinese, yeah. like as like as if like Wong Kar Wai hasn't seen many films or something. Right? <laughs> um, um, but th there's no monocultural original originary kind of text here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was going to say something then. It just left my head entirely. Well, I, I was just the last thing I was going to add because Wong Kar Wai works in like a transnational team, like his cinematographer that he always uses is mm. is not Chinese. So yeah. Um, although he's lived in Hong Kong. Really. I know what I was going to say. I remember when that when it came out and it became widely available. A, a friend of mine said, "Like, is it a martial arts film?" He watched it. He was like, "But is it a martial arts film?" I was like, "I think so. Yes, in as much as it's about different styles, the survival of styles, legacies, transmissions. It's about Wing Chun versus Bagua versus whatever else you want. Um, yes, it's a martial arts film. But he was like, "Well, where's the punchy, kicking, blood, and where's all?" But it was there. Anyway. Thanks, Jamie. So, that's a great question. Yes. So my question probably sort of follows um, the bit you were saying about um, what's being translated or, or translating to what. So I was wondering, are there any power hegemony or construction of power in between, in the process of translation or, or, or creating a subline? Because as you mentioned earlier that um, uh, violence, something in a way, I say it in a way, it compose a power, compose threat in a way. So as, for example, Shang-Chi was, I, I, don't, I, I, can't, I couldn't say it as a proper inter uh, like, um, translation, it's more like a bit um, imitation mm -hmm. of um, the Great Master, it could be. So when they did that, what so why 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 they did that? I mean, I I doubt they did it just because of they like it or respect um, what they've done in Grand Master. So how how could that be a way of gaining or composing power in this process? Uh, I don't. I mean, y yes. So I, part of my point is that we, we look at these. If we just look at these two fights, the two films. They've got a lot of similar, not not literal similarities, but there's a lot of equivalences, right? In in the in the way that it's also a love story and it's it's the beginning of a relationship and and so on. And it's very but it's very stylized and um, and so on. So my interest is is if you use words like hegemony, um, I don't think in terms of like a literal fiendish decision. Ah ha ha! Let's have a stereotypical representation of Chinese martial arts, right? But I think that it's interesting to note the way that if whatever you've got in the Wong Kar Wai film in The Grandmaster, you've got incredible complexity in that scene. The way that that becomes filtered and I would, I would say simplified uh, in, the, in the Marvel film and the way that it becomes hyper-orientalized, it's, it's, it's almost 10 years later. It's kind of, if, if we were going to do a moralistic, orientalist analysis, you would say that's regressive. That there is regressive. China becomes magic, magical, mystical, magical. It's like, this is in Talo, right? This is the, this is the gay of a, literally a magical kingdom. The very notion of, uh, 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 the idea of one of the, one of the things that I um, share, uh, here, this book, Conjuring Asia, Magic Orientalism in the Making of the Modern World by Chris Coulter Jones. He, he says that essentially, when you're dealing with Orientalism or magic, it's the same thing in the West. Western magicians traditionally would either have like some kind of a turban on or they would pretend to be Chinese or Arabian because the East is magic. Europe is modernity, the East is magic. So if we're talking, that's simplifying in the extreme. The history of magic as performance like shows it empirically. The more, <laughs> there's a case, right? There's an actual true case where in London, there was a, a guy who dressed up in Chinese drag, I can't remember his name, Su Ling, I think, or Ling Su, right? It was the name. He was British. He was so British, white British, but he made himself be Chinese for his performance, and he lived in character as Chinese. And a Chinese magician was like, he's not Chinese, you know. He's Britain, they said, and the way that they solved it was by having a, a, a magic off, like they had a show, and all the audience went, no, no, he's definitely, he's much more Chinese than the other guy. So the guy who was actually Chinese wasn't Chinese enough 
to persuade the audience that he was Chinese. So the white guy dressed up uh, in, in Chinese caricature was authentic. And I think that uh, a film like um, Shang-Chi, if you want to judge it harshly, but this is regressive. It's a regressive representation of everything Chinese. It's a regressive representation of Chinese martial arts. It's, it's tokenism. It's, it's all of that. So there's hegemony, right? There's your Western uh, misrepresentation. Um, and uh, yeah, hmm? exactly. Um, and you don't get that in the Grand Master. And you've got East and West, and you've got modern and, and, and all sorts of stuff going on there. So yeah, I don't really like the. I like Chang Chi. I enjoyed it. But when you stop and look at it, you go, "Hang on a minute. It, it, is this a positive? Rep you know, you do that classic like one hundred and one. Is this positive or negative? This representation." I feel that this ethnicity has been represented positively because they can do Kung Fu. Ah, but is that a stereotype? Yes, that's a stereotype. Is that racist then? Yes, that's a bit racist then. And you're just stuck in this kind of weird conceptual black hole. So when I, when I watched Chang Chi, I, I couldn't treat it as a martial art film. I just watch it, I just seen it as a, a Marvel blockbuster, yeah. two hours popcorn film. I couldn't. Yeah, yeah I like that. I quite like this. I quite like the fight on the bus. Yeah. Quite like that. I was like, okay, well, we, we there's a reason to keep watching. This might go. But then it's, it's as soon as it translates into CGI, I, I don't. It's like, show me a real punch. <laughs> I watched in Kung Fu Panda. It's the same as watching Kung Fu Panda, which was very popular in China. Kung Fu Panda is great. Okay. Um, see. Interesting, yeah, that's that's a really, really, really interesting and good question because the sublime never stays still, right? Um, and there's lots of ways that you can think about that. You know, maybe you feel under pressure to go and see the pyramids or to go and see the northern lights. I need to go to Lapland to see the northern lights. And you see them and go, yeah, it's just like a screensaver. Because you're meant to have a sublime, sorry, no, no, a sublime experience, but you can't, you can't make a, an experience be sublime. Um, so thank you. Um, so I don't think it's like an objective. It, it's it's about an affective experience. So I watched the Grandmaster, and it was just the right time and right place for me. And I watched that film, and it blew my mind, and I. I was completely enthralled by it. Maybe if, I, if I'd never seen it and I watched it next year, I'd be like, yeah, it's not as good as Shang-Chi. Or you know, something like that. So I think that you, you know, if you're talking about from an audience's perspective, then you could perhaps do some audience research to find out what people are currently finding sublime. Sublime isn't a word that's in common use. People use it about food or that sublime, like tagliatelle, simply sublime. Right, that's, and they just mean nice or good or tasty. But the, I'm interested in that, what philosophers and aesthetic scholars were trying to pinpoint when they're talking about the sublime. They're talking about, so Wordsworth and Coleridge, they're in the Lake District and they're looking at these mountains and going, wow, what is that? Is that the power of God? Is that like, what, how do we, I'm totally blown away by that. But like, we go to the Lake District now and we don't have a sublime experience. Probably, unless we take some mushrooms or something. I don't know. <laughs> but then you can have those. So it's radically subjective or contextual. Um, I'm interested in the question of what is being wrestled with. And I, 
Would I say that one car while I was kind of going, I'm going to make a sublime film? No. But m that experience of it, that pulls me back to it. Mm -hmm. So, And I would say, you do Qigong, you have an experience. You do <laughs> pranayama breathing, you can have an experience. You, you, you get into a really, really intense round in a martial arts fight, you can have a sublime experience. It could be called sublime. Psychologists might not say it's sublime, but the, the, the effective status of it, well, it, it is sublime. Mm -hmm. it could. I'm not saying, let's bring back the sublime, everyone. I'm just trying to really think about... I'm trying to think about lots of things, but I think that there's a term that we haven't used yet in, scholar, in scholarly discourse, and that is the idea of the Orientalist sublime. And the way in which European thinking, in the European tradition about nature, the ancients, these forces of the world, it, it's almost like it goes onto another track and it goes Orientalist, has to refer to India, has to refer to China. Um, and that, that kind of short circuit interests me. Mm -hmm. So many discourses go, they go Eastern. So even a, a practice like the Wim Hof method, where this guy Wim Hof does all this breathing, like hyperventilation effectively, and then breath holding, and you can have these trippy experiences. That all gets displaced, and it must be something about yoga. It must be something about Kundalini. It must be about some communing with, with, with the divine, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just such a, an interesting thing. Like, it's not there in Christianity. It's just, it well, doesn't seem to be. Yeah, I think, yeah. It, but it is there in Christian mysticism. Yes, um, but it's not very common. Like, especially in the Bible, right? When you talk about magicians, they are from the East, like the Egyptians, like in yeah. Egypt, like in the Exodus, and also maybe in in New Testament when the, the you know, the magician from the East to, you know, to worship Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, so they are from the East as well. Yeah, the Magi. Yeah, yeah the Magi, yeah, so. Yeah, but they're from like you know, I don't know, like from the east. Probably. Yeah, it's yeah. Orient. Yes, yeah, so Orientals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Yes. Oh, yeah. Or a bit. Well, um, thank you for for the um, very interesting presentation. Um, I enjoyed it uh, very much, and one of the reasons that I enjoy it uh, is because I personally is a fan of Tony Le, as I told you before. So uh, when I uh, when I um, uh, first uh, see. Um, you try to um, just oppose um, the two scenes uh, together, okay? Um, actually, what um, uh, it seems to me that uh, one of the immediate similarities is um, because two, uh, both films uh, cast uh, Tony Le as uh, the protagonist. So um, I, I, I do think that there is a um, Tony Le connection in interpreting uh, these two scenes. So. Um, I'm just thinking that uh, when we come to uh, think about the sublime, uh, can we say that um, actually um, the performer or the actor uh, actually is um, a crucial agent um, of uh, representing such um, the idea of sublime? And I'm also, uh, when I hear your presentation, I'm also thinking that um, uh, is the sublime be able to be uh, translated if um, the scene happened to Liu Simu? Um, uh, uh, the character of Shang-Chi. Okay, uh, it seems that uh, it may not work so well, right? So, I'm thinking um, that um, uh, how important is uh, the performer um, or what role does the uh, performer play mm. in representing the sublime on the cinematic screen and mm. also what kind of um, affect and experience um, can be generated um, uh, with the different uh, performance. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really, uh, obviously really important, like who you cast in, in the lead long is, is going to determine a lot about the, the film and the performance. I wouldn't locate agency in any one place, like I wouldn't locate all the agency in the actor, I wouldn't locate all the agency in the director, I wouldn't um, you know, it's, it's, it's a complex apparatus, isn't it? But if you try to think about what would happen if you used a different actor, same everything else, then you would definitely, presumably, have, I mean, you'd have a different experience. 
And it presumably a different affect then, maybe. Um, and it is interesting to think about, the, the, to ponder. I mean, if you look at the nuance in, in Tony Leung, in, from the word go of that, from the very start of that fight, he's watching, he's looking at on his feet, and then they have a little exchange, and he kind of goes, hmm. Like, as if, like, oh, okay, we're dealing with this then, okay. And he kind of then steps up his game a bit. And then, and then it goes on, and then she changes her stance, and he goes, "Oh, so you're doing where you're now? Okay, so I'll do, I'll do your stance." And there's this really kind of complex conversation. A lot of it's really subtle, mm. but the same actor in the Marvel film, it's almost like he's not like finely etched, is he? It's just like he's a caricature, and it's, mm. it's such a. And I don't know, because you know, a, an actor can be brilliant, but a film can be a disaster. Um, so. The, the question of uh, the question of that is complicated. I always wonder about a character like Jackie Chan. So you know, for everything that you might say about uh, the the 2010 remake of the Karate Kid when they were in Beijing, and Jackie Chan plays um, Mr. I can't remember, but he's an old man and he's allowed to act old. I thought that was really quite remarkable, and I saw like a Jackie Chan that I'd never because he'd never been allowed to be that character. For everything else we can say about Jackie Chan, that, that just really, it struck me. So the short version of my answer to you is, I don't know. And I would probably have to ask you what you thought, because I, I, I don't know. I don't know. In a kind of analytic, or like just looking at the, the shots that you did, because I thought your comparison of the, the passing shot, you know, where a kind of martial arts shot where they just catch and, and that mirrors in both of the films. Uh, I then thought, Actually, there's lots of Tony Leung like action films mm -hmm. that, that that shot has been used. It's almost like the Tony Leung mm. romantic shot. Mm. So if you looked at like um, Hero, for example, Lin Xiong, mm. like he does exactly the same thing in slightly yeah. different context. But mm. um, so it's almost like that shot yes. in choreography is attached to his star persona. So it's like the Bruce Lee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you know, like. Is it the oh, it's so tragic? Ah, and okay, so yeah, could, that'd be a really interesting. So you could almost do like a genealogy of the mm. films that he's been in and look at those fight scenes to see mm. is there like a, a grammar, which I think you're absolutely right. It's maybe parodied or, or simplified to yeah. a problematic way mm. by the time we get to Shang Chi. I, I mean, I, I would. I, so in the in the Shang Chi, the I mean the, the arm lock that they get stuck in is just this. I mean, this is like lesson one. Like, oh, look, we're doing Tai Chi. So you can do this if you want. But the one that they get in, in, in um, yeah, they've got, it's much like, I don't know, it's something, but it's, I, I don't know what it is, but they're in, and, they're, and it's faster. It's, they're in, they're out, they kind of go, oh, okay. But you can also see some Wing Chun movement in Shanti as well, but like, yeah. it's not that clear. So yeah, like the circling of the hands. Like, yeah, I, I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah. done. But here's the question. I've never ever got around to looking this up, right? Mm. So, so uh, Tony Leung was was called Wen Wu, right? Mm. No, no, but but he was meant to be. He was meant to be um, in the Marvel in the original Marvel. He was um, Fu Manchu, right? Right. So they sanitized him and made him you know, a bit a bit nasty, but he'd be nice. He's not. He's not as bad as Fu Manchu. But is the Wen and the Wu are they the same as Wen and Wu? Right. Are they the characters for the 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 the, the Cultured and the, the physical, yeah, the two sides of uh, Chinese, and, then, and that's what he's called. Yeah, right. And that's the, okay. Of course. So I, I just I've never looked that up, but I just was wondering about that. Mm -hmm. When and who? Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, so me, me and first. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Um, thank you. It's really interesting. about why it's violence in China, for example, usually is fetishized. Yeah. Um, you know, why, why, why do we have this fascination or fetishization of mm -hmm. um, um, violence in, in that place? Yeah. So um, also, it, it's also linked back to Jamie's previous question about is the grandmaster of Chinese film or something? Because um, when I was thinking about 
because I was um, I was teaching a class and I was trying to recommend TV shows to Chinese TV shows to my students and I just start search on the internet and I found that the most popular ones in recent years and it's all like martial art work um, the television shows in, in China and to be honest I haven't watched Shang Chi but for the Grandmaster um, I, I can't see much difference between the TV shows that Chinese audience love watching and Grandmaster whether it's more targeted on the Western or or um, universal audience or just Chinese audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I mean, like, I'm also thinking about the role of audience because if the Chinese if the Chinese audience also like love like the idea of um, mystifying their own culture, like martial culture, and they really enjoy it, watching it, is this kind of self orientalism or something? So what happens if this sublimity travels? back from the West to, 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 to China? Yeah. I, well, I think that the short answer is that not just China, but a, a large number of nations work out quite quickly that they really need to play up to their international image. Mm -hmm. And if, if the international... So, you know, the, the Shaolin Temple wasn't reopened until after the film, The Shaolin Temple. Um, mm -hmm. And and most people's knowledge of the of the history of it um, stem from films. So this is this is as true in Japan as it is in in the Philippines. Is catching up because they kind of go, oh, Cali, yes, scream, my Westerners like that. Okay, let's do this. Let's make it a national sport and let's go for it. Um, and and the, the South Korea, they, they kind of go, yeah, 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 yeah. Before the Japanese, we had a thing called Techion. It's amazing. It's not, <laughs> don't get me started. Anyway, um, so this idea of playing up to the... I mean, if you go to Edinburgh, if you go to Loch Ness, right, you, you're going to be buying the Loch Ness Monster, you're going to be buying kilts and sporans and whiskey, and it's like that's what, that's what culture is nowadays, right? Um, so, yeah, self-orientalization is a thing, self-orientalism. It, it caters to a market. Uh, historical revisionism is a thing. It, uh, all you know, all cultures do it. To invent a nation, you have to invent history as well. You have to invent a common language. You have to invent so. This is all well established. Um, an interesting thing that um, really surprised me. So, the translator, one of the translators of the Jin Yong novels, is called uh, Gigi Chang, and I interviewed her on Monday for a podcast that I do. And I was really surprised because, like she said, Jin Yong is everywhere, like all at Hong Kong, and it's just all the time, films, remake of films, television series, all the time. I didn't actually know that. It was so everywhere. But and I kind of said, well, so what would a, a Westerner, or someone who was outside of that cultural context, need to kind of access Jin Yong novels? And she said, oh, you know, just Crouching Tiger, The Matrix, and Star Wars. That's all you need. And I was like, whoa, translator of a Chinese a Hong Kong cultural text going, yeah, The Matrix, Star Wars, The Force. Well, if you know that, you're fine. Once you know about The Force <laughs> and The Matrix, you can, you can get it. It's like, because normally, you know, academics, and oh, you can't access this culture. You could never truly understand Jin Yong unless you'd lived in Hong Kong for 35 years. Uh, and even then, you probably could never understand it because you're a white Westerner, right? But she's like, yeah, it's Star Wars. It blew me away, that comment. The translators are often very pragmatic. Chi, the force, yeah, same thing. <laughs> Which yeah, it is. The one, right? Yeah, the one, exactly. Yeah. Primal oneness, let's, 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 let's blend with the universe, even if it is a computer program. Yeah. Okay. Um, final questions. Yes. Um, yeah. Just I want to add a sentence to the previous discussion. I think Tony Law is a very special one. Because when she's still there, there is someone floating around. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So I don't know whether there's a research about this star's personality. Yeah. Uh, my, my final question, just in my bag, not you, um, is a linguistic question. As you mentioned, there are maybe different words in other countries about the sublime. Mm -hmm. Like, how much do you need a word? 
because if you try to type in the name, you will be talking to me mm -hmm. in Kung Fu. Yeah. And then in Japanese, there's Korea or what is that here? Like Kankuraki. And mm -hmm. in Korean, there is a Han. So I think every country has a, a word for this kind of thing. But when you use the English, writing them in English, how much we need to find a word to make this kind of discussion? Yeah. Uh, and I, with the Tony Young and the, the persona and the star studies, I mean, that, that, that star studies and, and, and personality studies is a research area. And I've always resisted that as a thing. But then if you think about it, if I think about it, you couldn't substitute Bruce Lee. Just couldn't, it couldn't be done. So there's something singular about, about that. Um, about, even if, say, with like with with Tony Long, you can trace certain motifs across his films, and you can trace like you can trace the sameness of Bruce Lee across across many films, um, a few films. Um, so yeah, but we need to talk to Dorothy about this, um, and and yeah, and in terms of like linguistic and, and cultural translation, it's complicated. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a linguistic translator, right? Um, not by any stretch. But it is interesting to think of. So some of the, the processes, the, the, there's a, a really interesting book called um, Tai Chi and the Search for the Little Old Chinese Man. It's by Adam Frank. And he has a section on the translation of concepts into English language usage, like chi. And also all that stuff, push, press, roll back, all of these, all of these concepts. And you don't just get an accurate translation. What you get is an institution of people who are allowed to speak on a subject. So who can say whether that's qi or not qi? Well, if we've got a Chinese person. Is it qi? I don't know. I've never. I don't know. But like, or then the next best thing is someone who's like, I've studied at, the, at Wudang Mountain. And, and look at me, I'm wearing Chinese robes. Yes, I'm a white restaurant, but, but here I am. And they then, okay, Sifu, then let's go. What? And so you get institutions to legislate what she means and, and whether that is she or not she. Same as you get institutions to, to legislate on what the sublime is. And you get philosophers saying, it's not the sublime if it's just a Tony Young film. It's not the sublime if it's Bruce Lee. It's just... But then you've got other people, like in, in cultural studies and film studies, going, it is sublime. God damn it. So that's just the way language works, isn't it? Like... Um, there's a lot to say about that, but I think that with uh, notions of translation need a theory of institutions and stabilization very much. So there's the difference between a language and a dialect. A language is connected to government and the power and dictionaries and syllabus and exams. Whereas, and you know, there's an argument that one of the one of the sneakiest things the British did in in uh, Hong Kong was to just let everyone keep speaking Cantonese, and then English. To kind of really put a buffer between Mandarin, Chinese, and but it's complicated, and we can't. That that's I don't know. I mean, it's complicated. I know the theory, but not the, not the practice. Well, that's fascinating discussion. So uh, shall we call it? Okay. So thank, thank you, you very so much. much.